good afternoon all. Those are, although I'm a politician, I must say I'm not very good at observing protocol. So forgive me if I miss you, but I will um, start off by greeting the former president, Mr. Dudley de Klerk, and um, I don't know if he's left, but um, the German ambassador, Martin Schaefer. And then, should there be any other dignitaries in the room, you'll have to forgive me. Um, Australia High Commissioner. Sorry? Australia High Commissioner. Oh, well, the Balkan is here too. Thank you for <laughs> being here. And I think what I'd like to start to say that last year the Wall Street Journal wrote that South Africa was at a crossroads. And surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, in 2018, the medium term budget policy statements also echoed the sentiment that South Africa was at a crossroads, stressing the difficult economic and fiscal choices confronting the government. And in 2017, South Africa was, what do you know, once again at a crossroads. Um, according to a discussion that was held at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. No doubt an expert in something somewhere was saying we are at a crossroads the year before that, and again another 10 years before that. So in thinking through how we might edge closer to the vision of the Constitution, it would be quite trite for me to say that we are at a crossroads now, upon which the entire future of constitutionalism depends. Because more often than not, there is a fork in the road and choices to be made. There is seldom novelty in that fact. We are constantly presented with choices of profound significance that will lead us in one direction instead of another. I say this because when I present what I think are our choices, this is not a singular crossroads or watershed moment. Rather, just outlining some of our temporal choices until we are confronted with yet another fork in the road. Now, our constitution envisions, among other things, a non-racial society, and to free the potential of each person. I highlight these two visions in particular. Now, these ideals are, in South Africa are interwoven, but their future, and thus that of the constitution, are under threat. If we cannot free the potential of each person, we make achieving non-racialism that much harder. Now, before I give a more detailed account of this position and its implications for our future, it needs mentioning that it has now become almost de rigueur where politicians and business leaders meet to declare that South Africa needs a new social compact or social contract. And for, for what purpose? To set out a common vision for all stakeholders which would articulate the basic rules of the game that if abided by would help us to achieve our shared national aspirations. The thing is, we have such a social contract, the Constitution. The idea that South Africa requires a renewed social compact is almost exclusively motivated by the acknowledgement that there is a profound trust deficit in our society. But unless we wish to corrode that trust further, which, unless we wish to corrode this trust further, what we cannot do is draw up a new contract because we have failed to live up to the aspirations of the present one. Instead of bold pronouncements of new social compact building, we need to mount a less coy defense of the one we already have. It means we cannot stand by while it is lampooned and use the scapegoat for political failure. If the constitution can be undermined, the original social compact as it were, then no other future compact will be worth the paper it's written on. The future and the legitimacy of the constitution in South Africa is ultimately tethered to two aspirations which I have mentioned. The one is non-racialism, and the other is improving the quality of life of citizens. The further we move away from these two ideals, the weaker the support for the Constitution becomes. If we survey the latter, that is improving the quality of life of citizens, the prognosis for our future does not look good. The standard of living, at least measured by access to basic services, admittedly has significantly improved for the majority of South Africans since 1994. However, growing inclusion in basic services has happened against the backdrop of stagnant and in some cases expanding gaps in income. Many South Africans are still very poor. More than half of South Africa lives in poverty as defined by the upper bound poverty line, specifically meaning that 55% of the country survives on less than 992 rand a month and less than 33 rand a day. Furthermore, the real level of dependency, that is the ratio or the number of economically inactive people to those who are economically active, is constantly rising. In fact, there are now more people in South Africa who are
are unemployed than those who are working, which means that while there are more people than ever before who have access to education, healthcare, electricity, water, and housing, there are fewer and fewer people able to pay for these facilities and public services. So funding basic services via redistribution against a backdrop of rising unemployment is not a viable model for sustainable economic integration or political stability. Those who complete matric in South Africa and continue to a tertiary education, who then go on to higher wage employment where they have enough to both take care of the present and to invest in the future, therefore building future wealth, are a small fraction of the population, an elite even, and very likely a global elite. <coughs> And yet these, or we are, the principal beneficiaries of frontline interventions of transformation policies. Shareholdings, management control, further skills development and training of graduates reaches those who manage to avoid childhood stunting. One in four children in South Africa are stunted. It reaches those who manage to escape grade four with the ability to read for comprehension, which many children do not. And furthermore, our current attempts at redress um, really attract or impact those who manage to overcome a public transport system which works against them. And if we've looked at studies from 2003 to 2013, it shows the average commute time for South Africans in fact increasing and getting increasingly more expensive. So these are the areas which desperately beg for our attention if we are to live up to the constitutional vision of freeing the potential of every South African. Failure in this regard has a huge cost not just an economic cost, but a social and a political one. The cost of failing to enhance economic opportunity is to allow the disparities of the past to persist. It is often said that poverty has a black face. The other side of that coin, the implicit or perhaps explicit idea, is that wealth has a white face. Now, grinding poverty may not nourish the body, but it does feed racial animus. We cannot change the economic reality of the majority of South Africans, then we cannot change the social reality of heightening racial division, which is why a deteriorating economy is such a powerful weapon in the hands of those who choose to mobilize on race. It is not difficult to predict that redistributing resources among society's elite will not result in broad-based and sustainable economic mobility. Now, what does this have to do with the Constitution? Well, as we have observed, persistent economic disillusionment heightens feelings of frustration with a constitution that some from the onset saw as overly measured and enabling the wheel to turn too incrementally towards economic justice. We are nudged even more dangerously towards constitutional apathy and despondence as we are now when constitutional amendments are deployed to fill the vacuum of political will. The other headwind facing the legitimacy of the Constitution is a social headwind, propelled, of course, by the, by the economic headwinds, which we have just described, and that is the absence of a shared understanding of non-racialism, its meaning and its relevance. South Africa's social fault lines are still largely based on race, to the detriment of the non-racial society our Constitution <coughs> envisions. Consequently, when economic pressure is applied, it is the cracks in race relations which first become pronounced. The reason race is still such a soft spot for South Africa, such that it cannot withstand much pressure applied to it, is not only because of the economic reality described previously, but because we have all fudged what non-racialism <coughs> means. It means all things to all people. This has the consequence of building the kind of this has the consequence, sorry, this has consequences for the kind of society that obviously the Constitution enjoins us to defend. We cannot defend a shared social compact when there's rampant political confusion about one of its most critical terms. The two contested interpretations are principally, in my view, a distinction between multiracialism and non-racialism. In popular parlance in South Africa, the country is referred to as the Rainbow Nation, in the early 90s, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, there's a popular quote that says, move your hands, look at your hands, different colors representing different people. You are the rainbow people of God. Now, 
we are not here to judge, but just to observe that whatever its merits or demerits, rainbowism, the idea of different race groups living in harmony together, requires color consciousness, not the negation of it. For many, this is a compelling idea that people of different races could live together in harmony as one people. The challenge, however, is that rainbowism concedes race in order to offer up the hope of, differences, of different races living in harmony. Meaning that under such a conception, it is not per se illegitimate to think of people as belonging to different racial groups. Now, this idea to me is the domain of multiracialism, not non-racialism. Non-racialism distinguishes itself from multiracialism by stressing the illegitimacy of race as bad in science and bad philosophically. Philosophically, questions such as what are the criteria that differentiate one racial group from another, and what are the shared goals or beliefs of different racial groups? These are questions which are near impossible to build a coherent ontology or a philosophical meaning of race around. So rejecting race for the non-racialist is not the same as rejecting racism, however, Racism and prejudice do not require race to be real in order to exist. We know very well that bad events in human history have occurred on the basis of false beliefs. Having said that then, the notion of a colorblind nation is then the natural progeny of a non-racial philosophy. It is the idea that while skin color is clearly observable, one's thoughts, opinions, and experience of shared events are unique. The idea of colorblindness now increasingly appears outmoded and out of touch. But colorblindness as an idea suffers a more serious crisis, in fact, than merely being outdated. It has not so much gone out of fashion with the younger generation in South Africa as actually having been rejected from first principles. The color consciousness of the younger generation presents the logical conclusion of multiracialism and the rainbow nation. Now there is a nationalist and parochial tie sweeping much of the globe. The question of whether non-racialism is best conceived as multiracialism or denial of the existence of race, as supported by the likes of Neville Alexander and Robert Sibulwe, cuts right exactly to the heart of the kind of society we are trying to build. And that question is yet to be settled, in my opinion, but burns at the epicenter of our social divisions. The path of multiracialism is a future where we need always grapple with our inherent racial differences and struggle to reconcile them to a common purpose. Alternatively, the path of non-racialism is a future where our skin color does not imply inherent difference. There will always, of course, be differences to be reconciled, differences of culture, of language, of values, but not race. A non-racial future perhaps holds the potential or hope of a future where race has, you know, as a beast has been tamed and largely left to rest in the past as an artifact of history. So ultimately, we are faced with an economic as well as a social challenge to the future of the Constitution, both in a mutually reinforcing race against one another. We either arrest the economic decline and therefore arrest the economic pressure which weighs against racial divisions and which hastens calls to tamper with the Constitution. Or similarly, we can arrest the confusion on non-racialism. And perhaps we can mount a united front which turns around the economy and brings about opportunity for all. Neither an easy task, but available choices nonetheless. And I suppose the, the topic that I was going to speak on, or that I was asked to speak on, is this hope for the future. Now, I don't know whether any of this provides any hope necessarily, but it does set out what our options are. Our options to unite and actually regain coherence on these ideas of non-racialism and what it would mean to create equal opportunity for all. And I think where there are opportunities, there is usually equal opportunity for hope.
Thank you, Gwen. Uh, I think you've uh, sketched some of the main challenges lying ahead for constitutionalism of creating a non-racial society and of creating a society in which all South Africans share meaningfully in a better future. We are now going to ask uh, the author of the 2nd of February 1990 to share his views about the past 30 years, the successes, the challenges, and where we now stand in the new South Africa. We need to know Mr. Chairman, I listened with great attention to the previous speaker, and I would like also to thank all the other speakers of earlier today. The speeches were of such a high quality, all of them, and the participation by the audience was also of a very high level. Thank you for all those who organized today. It was, I think, a great success, and hopefully we all go home with deep food for thought, and all go home motivated to get onto the playing field. It is a great pleasure for me to address you this afternoon on the eve of the 30th anniversary of the speech that I delivered to Parliament on the 2nd of February 1990. The speech which initiated the constitutional transformation of South Africa. It was the beginning of the resolution of the core problem that dogged South Africa since the establishment of the Union in 1910. That pro problem arose from the fact that in keeping with the colonial approach of the times, Britain had invested had this the total power in the new union in the hands of the minority white nation. In a rapidly changing world, this relationship would prove to be increasingly untenable. As the tide of imperialism ebbed from Africa, South Africa found itself floundering in the last pool of white rule. We were glaringly out of step with the new international norms of non-discrimination, equality, and self-determination that had been articulated in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Between 1960 and 1989, South Africa entered a vortex of deepening isolation and escalating conflict. By 1986, my colleagues in the National Party and I had accepted that the only solution to this problem lay in dismantling the injustices of apartheid and in reaching agreement with the genuine representatives of all South Africans on a new and inclusive constitution. At the end of the 1980s, history opened a window of opportunity for change. By 1987, both the ANC and the government had accepted that there would have to be negotiations. After the decisive South African victory at the Battle of Lombar River in southern Angola in October 1987, President Gorbachev pulled the plug on Soviet and Cuban military intervention in southern Africa. He instructed the Cubans and Angolans to reach an agreement with South Africa. The ensuing tripartite agreement of 1988 led to the withdrawal of Cuban troops from Angola and to the successful implementation of the United Nations Independence Plan for Namibia. In February 1989, in a surprise move, my predecessor, Mr. P.W. Wurta, resigned as leader of the National Party. 
I was elected in his place by a national party caucus that clearly wanted change. In November 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall signaled the collapse of Soviet communism and the victory of liberal democracy and free market economy. On the 2nd of February 1990, ladies and gentlemen, that day and that speech was not the result of a Damascus Road conversion. Neither was it forced on us by the ANC, by sanction, or any other external factor. Despite our growing isolation, our economy was still growing at 2,7% between 1987 and 89, at a higher rate than today. We faced no significant military or security threat particularly following the withdrawal of the Cubans from Angola. We were motivated overwhelmingly by our own determination to break out of the deep injustice that characterized our relationship with the great majority of South Africans. We accepted that the lasting resolution of the impossible situation in which history and ourselves had placed us would have to be constructed on principles of justice and equity. We realized that the circumstances for successful negotiations would never again be so favorable. And we knew, we knew that with the passage of time, the balance of forces would inexorably shift against us. So, on the 2nd of February 1990, we opened the way to constitutional negotiations. We led through the window of opportunity that had been blown open by the winds of change from Eastern Europe. The negotiations, and we've heard a lot about that today, between 1990 and 1993 were a roller coaster ride of hard bargaining, faceless violence, walkouts, and crises. Nevertheless, by December 1993, we had agreed on an interim constitution that included the supremacy of the constitution and the rule of law, an independent judiciary, multi party democracy the separation of powers, acknowledgement of South Africa's diversity of languages, cultures, and religions, and an entrenched and justiciable Bill of Rights. It also contained the 34 immutable principles. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the greatest achievement in South Africa's long and troubled history. It was acknowledged by the whole world as one of the century's most successful and inspiring peace processes. It was not the revolutionary victory now claimed by the ANC. It was, on the contrary, a victory for all South Africans based on common interests and compromise. For the first 13 years, our new constitutional democracy functioned reasonably well. The late Nelson Mandela worked tirelessly to promote reconciliation, to promote national unity. More significantly, in 1996, the ANC jettisoned the socialistic RDP and replaced it with the much more market-orientated gear approach. The SACP and COSATU found themselves in the political wilderness and the National Democratic Revolution was for the time being put on hold. <clears throat> South Africa reaped huge benefits. The economy grew at more than 5% between 2005 and 2007. Unemployment declined and Trevor Manuel balanced the budget Yes. and half the national debt to only 23% of GDP. Hmm. However, 
President Mbeki's policies were anathema to the SACP and Fosato. They decided in 2006 at Kosato's 9th Congress to recapture the heart and soul of the ANC. Mm. They resolved that the working class must redirect the NDR toward socialism. And I quote, at the ANC's 2007 National Conference in Polokwane, a coalition of the SACP, Kosato and the ANC Youth League, defeated the very surprised President Mbeki and elected Jacob Zuma as the ANC's president. Mm. What a sad day that was for South Africa. Mm -hmm. It was the most significant shift in South African politics since 1994. The victorious coalition was able to seize control of the ANC, to oust President Mbeki, and to place government policy firmly black on the road to the National Democratic Revolution and Socialism. In March 2012, the new leadership announced the commencement of the so-called second phase of the National Democratic Revolution. According to Jeff Khadebe, Changes in the balance of forces in South Africa and globally have made it possible for the ANC to dispense with some of the cumbersome constitutional compromises on which the first transition, as they called it, was based. This approach was later defined by President Zuma as radical economic transformation, which he said would require, and I quote, a fundamental change in the structure, systems, institutions, and patterns of ownership, management, and control of the economy in favor of all South Africans." End of quote. Combined with the 2008 global economic crisis, the ANC's new approach resulted predictably enough in sluggish economic growth higher unemployment, the doubling of the national debt, and the discouragement of investment. Mm. However, to the consternation of the South African Communist Party and Kosati, President Zuma turned out to be a far more wily politician than they had anticipated. Mm. While they were trying to capture the state for the National Democratic Revolution and Socialism, he succeeded in capturing it for himself. <laughs> in 2008, the ANC opened the floodgates of corruption. They did so by disbanding the Scorpions, an independent and highly successful corruption fighting unit. The National Prosecuting Authority, important elements in the police and intelligence services, were soon under President Zuma's control. The country lost tens, if not hundreds of billions of rands in rampant and unrestrained corruption. Mm. Fortunately, the institutions that have been included in the Constitution were resilient enough to defeat Jacob Zuma's state capture project. A combination of resolute action by the former public protector Tuli Malonsela investigative journalists, civil society, the courts, and ANC stalwarts ultimately led to President Zuma's downfall. At the ANC's national conference in 2017, Mkosasana Zuma, President Zuma's chosen successor as president of the ANC, was narrowly defeated by Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa. Since then, President Ramaphosa has taken some significant steps to restore the integrity of key government institutions and to restructure state-owned enterprises. He has recommitted himself to the implementation of the Pragmatic National Development Plan and to economic growth fueled by increased levels of investment. Nevertheless, doubts persist. 
Does President Ramaphosa have the ability and will to challenge the deeply entrenched Zumaites in the ANC's top structures? Will he be prepared to face down the trade unions by making the deep cuts in state-owned enterprises, expenditure and employment? When will those involved in state, face, state capture face prosecution? Important questions to which the country is waiting for answers. On a number of occasions in the past, I have warned that South Africa was at the crossroads. Well, now to me it is abundantly clear that the crossroads are behind us. Mm -hmm that we took the wrong turning several years ago and that we are now rapidly heading away from the high road of non-racial constitutional democracy. The factions that have led the ANC since 2007 have no intention of honoring the agreements that were included in the 1993 and 1996 constitutions. Instead, they believe that they are still involved in a continuing revolutionary struggle to achieve, and I quote, a fundamental change in the structures, systems, institutions, and patterns of ownership, management, and control of the economy. In July 2018, Ace Magashule emphatically rejected, and again I quote, the false view that our democratic breakthrough was in itself the end of the struggle for the liberation of our country. Mm. He said the living truth is that the democratic breakthrough was not at all the end of our revolution, but only the beginning of more protracted struggle mm. for transformation. Mm. A refusal to accept the new constitution as the foundation and the cornerstone of the new South Africa. I think we are on the wrong road as far as language and cultural rights are concerned. Come on. The assurances in the Constitution regarding language and cultural rights are being ignored by the government mm -hmm. and are being eroded by the courts. Our foundation will soon publish a report card that will deal in detail with the dilution of these rights. I also think we are on the wrong ideological road. The ANC majority is determined to follow the road to the NDR and to socialism, regardless of the catastrophic consequences. The most serious manifestation of the ANC is committed to the National Democratic Revolution and Socialism is its determination, apparently at any cost, to amend Section 25 of the Constitution to make it possible for the state to expropriate property without the payment of compensation. Now it apparently wants to remove the role of the courts in determining the amount of compensation for expropriated property. There is, ladies and gentlemen, an absolute correlation between the recognition of property rights mm -hmm. and economic well-being on the one hand, investment inflows, political and civic freedom, human development, and good governance. Mm -hmm. The 20% of countries that best protect property rights outperform those that least protect property rights mm -hmm. in virtually every important category of societal success. Mm -hmm. This 20 top 20% who best protect property rights have per capita incomes nine times higher than the bottom 20%. They receive 22 times more investment per capita. They enjoy far higher levels of human development. The integrity of their governance is significantly better and most importantly, they enjoy civil and political freedom while countries that least protect property rights are unfree. And then, ladies and gentlemen, most seriously, we are on the wrong road with regard to race. Mm. 
our government has abandoned the great example of racial reconciliation that was set by Nelson Mandela. Its public discourse is increasingly characterized by negative racial stereotypes. White South Africans are castigated as the bearers of original sin. They are told that they are not the rightful owners of the land to which they hold legal title. Their relative pros prosperity is not the result of their own hard work, qualifications and ingenuity, but of the historic exploitation of others. They are being made scapegoats for all of the continuing problems of the country, including unemployment, inequality and poverty. They are told by a constitutional court judge that their culture should be buried in the dustbin of history. And they are referred to as colonialists, as aliens who do not really belong in South Africa and who have made absolutely no positive contribution to the country. The disturbing thing about such stereotypes is that they are fervently believed by those who propagate them, including disturbingly some of our top judges, chapter nine institutions, and many political leaders. All this, ladies and gentlemen, is extremely dangerous. Such stereotypes dehumanize people. They create space for even more radical elements to sweep up ethnic animosities and increase the danger of racial conflict with all the dreadful and irreparable consequences that would ensue. The ultimate goal of the ANC's racial policies is the establishment of what they call a national democratic society in which virtually everything, jobs, land, and wealth, will be allocated to people according to the percentage of their race, that their race group represents in the national population. It is called demographic representativity. Demographic, demographic representativity has already been implemented rigorously in the public sector with the results that are evident to us all. The ANC now wants it to be applied with the same fervor in the private sector, at our universities, and in our sports teams. Already demographic representativity is limiting the economic space in which minorities can operate to their diminishing shares of the population. This has very serious implications. 37% of South Africans in my over 80 age group are white, compared with only 4% below the age of five. There are more whites in the 70 to 74 age groups than there are in the zero to four age group. At the same time, there are more than eight times as many black children in the a zero to four group as there are elderly black Africans in the 70 to 74 group. In a society where everything is distributed according to racial percentages, prospects are very bleak for those who belong to diminishing minorities. Those who exceed their racial quota will be consigned to a twilight world of self-employment or emigration thus ratcheting down their racial share of the population even more rapidly. All this is contributing to a serious and unaffordable erosion of the country's skills and tax base. Mm. It is a mathematical certainty that on this basis, democratic representativity will within a few generations lead to the reduction of our white and probably our Indian communities to an insignificant percentage of the total population. Wittingly or unwittingly, the government's racial policies, together with rampant crime and the threat to health services posed by the NHI, 
are posing an existential threat to our minority community. The ANC, ladies and gentlemen, is doing, unfortunately, what its radical faction always said it was going to do. It is progressively dispensing with the compromises that were included in the Constitution at the insistence of minority parties. It is actively pursuing its goal of radical economic transformation. It is continuing its protracted struggle for transformation, in essence, against a section of the population on the basis of their race. In doing so, by progressively ratcheting up the enforcement of BBBEE, by extending the enforcement of demographic representativity to all sectors of the econo e economy, and now by changing the constitution to enable it to expropriate property without compensation. South Africa, and it breaks my heart to say, in 2020, is emphatically on the wrong road. It is heading not toward a new dawn, but toward every dark and threatening, very dark and threatening storm cloud. The FW De Klerk Foundation will use all its powers it enjoys in terms of the Constitution to combat this process in civil society, in the courts, and even in the international arena. I today, ladies and gentlemen, implore the ANC to turn back, to return to the road of the pragmatic policies that it followed between 1996 and 2007, and that have enabled so many other countries to achieve sustained economic growth and social development. I implore the ANC to abandon ideologies that have brought economic collapse and tyranny wherever they have been implemented. I implore the ANC to return to the road of genuine non-racialism and reconciliation. And I implore the ANC to return to the road of freedom, toleration and non-racialism that we charted in our constitution with so much hope and goodwill 24 years ago. The ANC will find us and all other South Africans of goodwill waiting for them on the constitutional high road. We, for our part, will continue to honor the foundational values on which our constitution was based and upon which the future prosperity, freedom and happiness of everyone in South Africa depend. I'm deeply concerned. I haven't lost hope. I think we have the capacity in South Africa to ensure a return to the high road. Thank you very much. Come on.